Good day, Brad. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me today over Zoom. What we're going to do is kind of introduce you to our audience, and we're going to walk through several questions that I have to do with that. So let's start with, where did you grow up? Uh, where did I grow up? First off, hello, Guy. And it's really a nice, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, where did I grow up? So just to be clear, unlike a lot of your other guests, I am Canadian. Uh, I grew up all over Canada because my dad was in the Air Force. So I lived on different Air Force bases across the country, mostly on the East Coast here where I live in Halifax, but also uh, in the center of Canada in Winnipeg and in a couple of bigger, more cities that you've probably heard of, like Montreal and things like that. Yeah. Very good. So, and where did you go off to school and what did you study? So I finished high school here, went off to uh, Canada's Royal Military College. It's in a town called Kingston, Ontario. It's near Toronto. Uh, and I started off in engineering, very quickly figured out that I, I was suited to different things. And, uh, and I completed a degree in history and uh, political science. Very cool. All right, so you live in Halifax? Right now? I live in Halifax right now, yeah. Uh -huh. and, uh, and, and that's where you're working. Can, can you, let's start off with your current job and then we're gonna back up to what you did in the military. Sure. So what are you doing right now? So right now I'm the program manager of a, uh, a new department in a company called Fleetway Incorporated. And so I'm the program manager for training. So I manage all of their training uh, programs and projects. And Fleetway Incorporated is a company, part of the J.D. Irving family of companies, um, which is really a global, uh, a global set of companies. They're in, they do things in pulp and paper. Uh, you may have heard of Cavendish Foods. That's, that's, in, the, uh, that's in the U.S. Uh, and they do shipbuilding. So Irving Shipbuilding International is a, is a major global shipbuilder. Uh, and Fleetway is kind of a sub-company of, of that. Oh, you want me to go all the way back now? Oh, yeah. No, let, yeah, let's go back to, so you, you got out of this school in Kingston. Tell us a little bit about that school. You, you studied history and politics. And, and so where'd you go uh, in the military from there? Yeah, so uh, after graduating from the military college, I, uh, I went and did all of my naval training. Uh, so I, am, I was uh, what we call a naval warfare officer in Canada. Uh, it's like a naval uh, service warfare officer, I think, in the U.S. Navy, uh, and did all my uh, basic, uh, you know, ship handling and seamanship training out on the west coast of Canada. Joined a ship on the east coast, back in my hometown, uh, and uh, did a few years of uh, operational uh, sailing out of the east coast. Um, well, actually, the Pacific too. So, just like most folks in in various navies, I've been everywhere from the South Pacific to to uh, Europe, the Mediterranean, uh, the Middle East, obviously. And, and uh, I, uh, I, my specialty was above water warfare and anti-surface warfare. So that's what I specialized in. And after, after my sailing days, I, uh, I knew I had an interest in training uh, kind of from early experiences. And I spent a bit of time at our Naval Operations School in Halifax. So what kinds of roles did you play in training within the, the military? Yeah, so um, like most folks in every military around the world, we spend a lot of time as subjects or, uh, as I used to like to say, victims of training, of bad training in some cases, or subjects of good training. Uh, and uh, when... I think that kind of drove my interest in, in training. So when I went up to the Naval Operations School, I held a very, very variety of posts from uh, what we call a course officer, which is kind of the person that corrals students, uh, you know, to and from, uh, to and from their, 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 their courses. And you do things like scheduling and student administration. Um, and I was also an instructor uh, and managed a few programs. So yeah, all, all kind of roles in either management or instruction. And uh, where did you go from there? Yeah, so uh, so <laughs> after that, uh, you know, I'd, I'd done my time at sea, and uh, and I got kind of got the training bug and the education bug. So I actually left the regular force. Uh, we have a reserve and regular force similar to, to the U.S. I left the regular force, went to the reserves, and I took three years off, and I did a Bachelor of Education degree. 
Uh, and so, uh, and I, I tried my hand a little bit at teaching in the public system, uh, but very much wanted to get back in the regular force. In Canada, we have an occupation called training development. Uh, and there are officers who basically guide the training system. Uh, sometimes they're called in other forces training managers. Uh, you might you might have heard of that. Or in the old uh, Royal Canadian Navy or Royal Navy terms, we use the term schoolie. Quite proud of that term. Uh, and so I became a schoolie and, uh, and then spent the rest of my career in, uh, in different roles in the training system. I saw that you had an assignment with NATO. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I did, yeah. So after, after doing a, a few jobs as a training development officer uh, in, in, uh, in various schools, both with the Air Force and the Navy, um, I uh, had the pleasure to command our training development center in, uh, in Borden, Ontario, where we actually teach schoolies and personal selection officers. So anyone to do with HR and training is kind of taught at that school. Immediately after that, um, I was posted down to uh, Virginia, uh, Norfolk, Virginia, where uh, I really enjoyed my time. There's a, a NATO command there called Allied Command Transformation. And uh, I was the staff officer for training policy for NATO there. Uh, it was it was an absolutely super job working with, uh, you know, all NATO nations, uh, partner nations. Uh, you know, I think I worked with some 70 odd different nations, militaries and uh, and political you know, uh, entities in uh, in training there. It was it was super. I had the pleasure to uh, visit parts of the U.S. and North America that I had never been to before. Nice. Thank you for uh, answer and thank you for your service. Uh, let's so let's talk a little bit about your current job now. Uh, in the run up to uh, hitting the record button today, we talked a little bit about that. You kind of have a greenfield operation, an opportunity. Uh, so tell us a little bit about what you're doing there at Fleetway. Yeah, yeah. So you know, Fleetway is a company that's been around for uh, for many years. It started off as under a different name. And it's had various uh, roles and responsibilities in engineering and integrated logistics support for the Canadian fleet, stemming back to, um, you know, our current class of frigates called the Halifax class. They had a role in engineering support and, and in fact, training as well. Um, and Fleetway right now has a role in uh, our the construction and support to our Arctic offshore patrol vessels. Um, there's a great story of our, our latest one, uh, circumnavigating North America, along with a U.S. Coast Guard counterpart with uh, U.S. Uh, Coast Guard sailors on board. A really great kind of, um, you know, North American success story there. Um, but, but Fleetway decided some time ago that, you know, it, it really wanted to grab the bull by the horns in terms of training. Uh, there's a lot of potential. Obviously, there's a lot of business potential in training and training services. But I think it also had to do with linking um, the fact that, you know, we're, we're, we're an engineering and integrated support company that has a lot of data that knows the ship, that knows operations. And it just makes sense that if we know the work, we can probably make a serious and sound contribution to training. So I, I, uh, I you know, I, I know the managing director. He's, he's actually formerly an admiral that I worked for a couple of times. And so we had some discussions and we decided to try and make a go of it. So when you use the term greenfield, uh, essentially this is, uh, you know, I, I guess I get the, the challenge or the, the joy of setting up, uh, setting up a, a department inside a company uh, that will not just manage a training uh, solution, but also do anything from design and development uh, through, uh, through delivery uh, uh, work with other providers. So we work with Lockheed Martin Canada on combat systems, integrating those into platform systems. Uh, and it's really, uh, it's an exciting time. It's really, it's a very interesting transition for me <laughs> to, to jump into a job like this. So how long have you been into this uh, startup? I, I took the uniform off in May. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the uh, 8th of May, I think was the, was my first day on the job. Uh, as a civilian, um, and uh, honestly, it's been a great transition. I, 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 there, there are days. I'm sure you, you've had them over the years where you, you might have missed a few, few of those days at sea or, or experiences in uniform. Uh, and there are days when I miss them, but, uh, 
I guess my days are filled with enough challenge and enough new things that I don't think about it very much. I'm looking forward. Well, great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. There are some, some, uh, some times out at sea that, uh, that I miss and c- certain locations that we got to visit, but let me shift sure. gears here a little bit. And, uh, uh, this, this series of videos is HPT, Human Performance Technology Videos, and the intent is to uh, showcase the diversity of HPT practitioners and their practices. And so I, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about what was your first exposure to this thing that uh, is sometimes called HPT. It's got various names, but uh, so let's start with what do you call it? Uh, I, I call it HPT mainly because because my first exposure I think was uh, uh, I, when I when I did that transition from being a warfare officer to doing a bachelor of education to becoming a training development officer. There's a course that we all take. Uh, just there's a course for everything in the military. So uh, part of the way through this course, there was a lecture on on uh, on human performance technology, and I think I think someone brought in that that big big handbook of HPT. Um, and, and so I kind of, I started flipping through it and uh, there happened to be a fellow called Brett Christensen. And I do have to say his name and I probably going to say it a couple times here. Uh, I think I had a couple conversations with Brett like just investigating what the heck is this? Because, you know, I, I was interested in training. I just did a bachelor of education, a bachelor of education. Now I'm becoming a training development officer, but there's this other thing. What is this? And why are we talking about things other than training? And it really piqued my interest. Well, thank you. Yeah, I've, I've known Brett for quite a while, and he's been part of the uh, International Society for Performance Improvement, ISPI, which is my professional home since uh, 79. So, you know, I'm an old guy. But um, so, so that was your first exposure to it. So how do you see, let's talk a little bit about this. How do you see the overlay of HPT to training what's what's your particular viewpoint that you that you've come to in this well i think it all it's just going to sound cliche uh for me it all all boils down to the word performance right so you know training if you think of training the training programs that we have to set up and run for for sailors as new ships are introduced this is about us doing our very best to ensure that that particular sailor is going to be able to do their job safely uh, and professionally and competently when they, when they're brand new on a brand new ship, that's a performance. Uh, so, so, you know, you can do a lot of things in training to enable performance, but if you kind of peel back the layers of the onion a bit, there's a whole bunch of other things associated with performance. Um, as you know, I'm a big fan of a lot of your work. Um, you know, you talk about, you talk about workflow, you talk about performance on the job. We can talk about, um, we can talk about different uh, you know, motivators. We can talk about different environmental supports that kind of we, we can wrap around employees or sailors or whomever to, to enable their performance. So for me, this all boils down to performance. Where, where training overlays is, is, for me, that's where things get really, really formal. You know, that's where things get really, really almost scientific in a way to design the right experiences for sailors. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's it. It's, it's, it's all about performance. Well, thank you. So can you share with us so that our audience, you know, I want to follow up with uh, some of the, the resources that you have found useful. But uh, so who are some of your biggest influences in this? And, and we can talk about people and articles and books, videos, et cetera. But uh, what can you name the top three or five uh, uh, that are memorable? Yeah, I think. I- I could. I, my, I'm, I'm one of these people that tends not to be able to kind of rhyme off uh, uh, arcane references that I've used 20 years ago. Uh, I did. I did prepare for this, but you know, there, I think there's the classics. The, you know, the Bob Mager. Um, uh, you know, I've, I've pointed to you before. Uh, you know, I've, I've read a lot of your your work over the years. Uh, but then I really think to that experience I had with Brett Christensen. You know, and I was able to meet uh, Roger Chevalier uh, a while back. Um, and then, you know, these, these are the kind of people that formed my, uh, formed my impressions. I, 
Uh, we also were talking a bit before the interview started about how, you know, we typically don't just, you know, take one book and that's the guide, right? We don't say that. How things work is we say, hmm, this is a piece of this that I might like and I can adapt this to my practice. And I think over the years I've done that. And I've also spoken to a lot of people. And I like, I like to engage with people like we're doing now and get, get those ideas and kind of hash them out. Um, there's some great folks who, who we may not have heard of, and I, I'll mention the name, Wayne Gafford is a great guy, he's a civilian that works with the U.S. Navy. I worked with him a bit over the years. Here's a guy who really understands data and how to link data to competence. Uh, so, so I go to him. There's other folks, I, I well, back to books, I, I wrote a few notes here. I, I picked up uh, Donald Clark's latest book, Learn, Learning Experience Design. I think it's super fantastic. I in fact, I've got pencil marks all over that book and I've dog-eared it. I only owned it for a month, but I, I think it looks like it's years old. Uh, Mirjam Nealon and Paul Kirshner's new, new book, Evidence-Informed Learning Design, is absolutely fantastic. And to me, these latest books, now they're, you know, they're very much oriented towards learning and training because that's it's kind of my bias. It's my, it's my business. Um, but it, for me, it almost represents, I, I, I don't want to say this, but you know, we've got, we've got all the, the, the classic work, right? And then we've got, you know, the work that started classic and now is now evolving. I noticed, you know, some of your latest books are kind of real, almost like, almost like some of your ideas, which were great before, have just, just matured a little bit. Or I don't know if you've been ruminating on, the, on these <laughs> and just improving and improving, improving. And then there's another set of kind of folks that are just, that are, that are of that kind of all those ideas are starting to mature. And I'm, I'm really, I'm really interested in that. I mentioned data before. Um, yeah, I, I think, um, I think, you know, I did, I wanted to mention a couple other, a couple other things. I'm going to go on for a bit of thing. Go ahead. Um, a lot, a lot of, a lot of matrices are available out there. Like the two classics, the Rumler Brash model and the, uh, and uh, and Gilbert's uh, Gilbert's model, the BAM, you know, these are. There's a lot of writing around them, and there's a lot of businesses based on these things and using them, but, you know, that basic matrix in and of itself is such a great tool, especially for beginners. If you can start just by understanding what these matrices do and what they provide for you, I used these matrices in analyses from. Uh, I did some work. Ukraine is, is in the news for unfortunate reasons right now, but I did some work with Ukraine Def National Defense University using, using the BEM. I did some work with uh, NATO's Allied Command uh, Operations uh, using the Brumbuck Brash model. You don't have to know a lot to start. You, you have to know enough to start and you have to know how to use these tools. And so those are some of the tools that I, that I like to go back to time and again, and I'll often flip back and do a bit more reading. And like I said, mature those ideas and, and, and just use them in practice. I, I have to mention that uh, Gilbert's uh, behavior engineering model um, in his book, his 1978 book, Human Competence, the page before that was my favorite. It's, it's the, uh, uh, what's it called? The uh, behavior model for creating incompetence or something like that. And uh, I used to have two big giant posters in my office, one of each, the behavior engineering model, which is, you know, what you're supposed to do. But this, this model, this matrix on the page before, I, I would show that one to my clients as a way to introduce them to the behavior engineering model. We used to, in, in the consulting business I was in back in the 80s, we used to give that book out to our clients because, you know, this is what we're all about. We, we believe in this. And let me show you a few things in the book. And then the clients, of course, would set it aside. But but they'd look at that model for creating incompetence, and they would look at that and say, "Oh, that's what we're doing. That's us. That's us. We're doing this. We're doing that. We're doing. Oh my goodness!" Then we'd flip the page and say, "Okay, this is how you really should think about this." But those are great models. And Roger Chevalier, he had uh, made uh, adaptations. To this yeah. uh, several people have made adaptations to that model and updated it. And Carl Binders currently still doing that with uh, what he calls the six boxes, which is really the behavior engineering model, just updated with the more accessible language and such. Um, yeah, lots of, lots of good people in there. And I know that Brett Christensen is, uh, uh, was all about the going beyond instruction, training, learning, and looking at all the other variables. And I know that he was really close to Roger Kaufman and all that stuff. So Brett's people, 
Um, and I, I believe that he's on the faculty of Boise State right now, too, um, or at least he was recently. Yeah, that's right. Um, so let me shift gears here again slightly and ask you, if, if you were to do a 30-second elevator speech, and I, and I bring this up because to, to provide people with examples, with a model of how somebody else might talk about this. So I kind of set this up as that if you're at a neighborhood party and there's new neighbors that have moved in and they come up and say, you know, Brad, what do you do? How would you answer that? <laughs> yeah, so I, I kind of have two approaches depending on the audience. I might ask the person what they do first. And I know that seems a little underhanded, but sometimes if I know what industry that person is in, it makes a difference what I say. Uh, so if they're, you know, if, if I know they've got a background in our military or other militaries, I might, I might kind of describe my job as something to do with training development or course development or something like that. Um, what I've, what I've taken to recently, because of course I just took the uniform off and I'm new to this whole civilian business game, uh, is I, is I try and throw the word performance in there somewhere, uh, to show folks that, Hey, we do more than training, um, the 30 second eleva elevator speech uh, might say that, you know, I work for, I currently work for a training services company, sorry, an engineering services company uh, that supports new ship builds uh, through integrated logistics support and data management. And what I do is I enable new sailors or new customers to take over those new ships in competent ways through training or other means. And the advantage we have is that we can link the data and the engineering knowledge to the, the, the performance knowledge they need. And that may or may not do it for the person. They might just look at me and say, hmm, that was interesting. Because <laughs> I think we get that a lot in our line of work. You know, if, you, if you're in HPC, if you're in performance consulting in any way, or if you're in training, um, people tend to, uh, for ill or for good, have certain biases. They think of that regulatory training course they had to take that morning that lasted four hours and talk them about workplace hazardous materials or something like that. Um, and our trick is to try to kind of make it exciting and break them out of that, which is why I start with, well, first, what do you do? <laughs> well, I think that's a, that's a good strategy that uh, help uh, align what you're going to say perhaps to what they do to make it you know, hopefully resonate with them in terms of what you do. But uh, yeah, it's an age old problem. It's been a joke in, in uh, ISPI, NSPI before that, since I first got into the business. And uh, there was one of the uh, re more renowned people in the organization, the late Claude Lineberry, who uh, uh, back in the 80s and then again in the early 90s, uh, in keynote speeches, read a letter from his mama to him. And it was all about, son, I just still don't understand what you do. And it was always a food. But it's, it's been something that's kind of difficult to explain to people. how you can develop and train somebody in a job that you've never held. And, you know, that's always been a mystery for a lot of my relatives. And they could never really figure that out. But, uh, but thank you for that example. So, again, let me shift gears here. And uh, as a lifelong learner, can you share with us? what your current focus is or your next focus for learning. Um, and are you working on, uh, on anything in particular? Are you writing about it? How, are you sharing it in some way? So what's your focus? Okay. Um, I'll answer it three ways. Hopefully this will do it justice. Uh, number one, I, 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 when I finished my master's degree, actually, I think when I finished command and staff college in, in, in uniform, which kind of came after my master's, but it was very, very demanding and interesting. I, I kind of made a decision that I don't think I'm, I don't think it was in me to do any more formal learning. Like I don't, it's not, I'm not the kind of person that wants to do another master's or another mm -hmm. PhD. What I'd rather do is I'd like to find the things that I'm really interested in and just learn about them in different ways. So recently I have taken to listening to a heck of a lot of podcasts. On Saturday morning, I get up and I listen to, uh, I, well, I watch some of your videos. I, I've been listening to The Learning Hack, which I think is absolutely great, great podcast. And so I'm learning little bits and pieces. Um, where this has driven me and, and where my work in Fleetway is driving me is, is, is to actually do a little bit more 
research in a way into into data and all things data. I, you know, I'm as I said before, one of the things that we're doing is we're linking that technical data to our curriculum. Uh, and we're doing that through uh, using standards like S1000D or S6000T. I don't know if you've heard of those or used wisely, widely in the aviation industry. It's just a way of um, tagging data with, with different nomenclatures so that you can pull them out of where they sit and use them for training or for technical pubs or something. Um, but for me, it's about, okay, how do we actually manage that data in a way that, that one day becomes something relevant for a learner or anyone who has to access it. So I'm, I'm looking at those things. And it's a bit of a challenge for me because if, if you recall at the beginning, I said I started out as, as an engineer and quickly found that uh, my, my, <laughs> my, my preferences and abilities lay elsewhere. Um, <clears throat> that's kind of the second thing. And then the, the third thing is, is uh, I guess this is sort of personal professional development is, is, you know, if you spend 29 years like I did in uniform, uh, it doesn't really prepare you for things like, well, how do corporate finances work? You know, how do, how do you actually contribute to a business? Uh, you know, what, <clears throat> what's the difference between, you know, profit and overhead? Those, you know, those are, those are two very simple things, but there's more complex things. So I think on a, on a personal note, I'm, I'm kind of delving into something that's, it's not performance related, not training related. Um, yeah, and that's, that's what I'm doing. You know, am I, am I writing things? It's funny you should ask because I, I, just, I just started thinking about maybe, maybe putting something together a little more formal on paper. I've written articles for journals before and I presented at uh, IITSEC and, and ITEC in Europe and things. Uh, but uh, I think I'd like to get back in that because I think it's moments like this, sharing ideas with folks like you or a crowd of people that really, uh, really, really kind of um, spurs on idea creation and really interesting discussions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So my next question is about uh, language and nomenclature. Um, and I, I've asked this uh, because uh, it's a really, is there a favorite performance improvement term or phrase that you would like to define for us. And it's usually people want to say something, they pick, they pick one because they're annoyed with how the world at large is using the term or phrase. And they think maybe perhaps it's a being misused or it's something that they would like to put their own personal spin on uh, as they look at some part of our field. Now our nomenclature, our language has been messy and sloppy and it's been complained about since I got into the business. So, but, uh, so this is an opportunity for you to take a stab at uh, um, uh, sharing some of your thoughts about some of our language. What do you have for us? Okay, that's a, that's, that's a, that's a challenging thing to ask. Uh, maybe it's my nature, I, I don't know. Maybe it's, it's, it's my, uh, you know, former life as a sailor, so to speak. Me, I, I, I start to complain about things <laughs> before I, before I offer something constructive. I will start by complaining, and that's L and D. I think learning and development is is had had years ago such a potential to be such a great term and used for good, not for evil. But but now folks toss around L and D uh, all the time, and they don't mean L and D. What they mean is, is they're referring to, as I said, like that four hour regulatory course on workplace hazardous materials or something boring like that, which is necessary, but, you know, could be done better. So when you say L&D or when I, I've noticed recently in the past few months, when I've started to have conversations with folks in my company and elsewhere, when we, when we talk about L&D, you know, even internal uh, L&D, um, they, you know, they kind of close up. <laughs> Because they, they're not thinking the same thing I am. So that's one thing. Um, what, what I would, you know, there is a term that I like. And again, it's, 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 it's a training specific term or a learning specific term. And that's, that's the use of the word experience. I, I, I did not like it. If you'd asked me a year ago, and there's going to be people who watch this video who know me, who, who say he's full of baloney because he, he used to rail against this word. But I've actually changed my mind. I think the word experience, when we talk about learning experience design or instructional experience designers or something like that, it's, it has grown on me because it really speaks to me about what the learner or the, 
performer or the worker or employee has to go through. They have to go through an experience in some way. And so it's up to us as professionals to provide for them the most meaningful experience we possibly can. Uh, and that's, that's what it is. That's what it's all about for me, you know, and they get that experience. And at the end, they can perform the way they need to in order to meet their goals and, and the goals of the organization. So for me, the good word here is experience. That's the one I'll, I'll end on experience. Well, well, thank you. And I really like the fact that you, you've uh, framed this as a meaningful experience rather than a fun experience or an engaging experience. Uh, yeah. I don't know of any experiences that I had in the U S Navy, especially in boot camp, that weren't engaging. Now they weren't a whole lot of fun <laughs> and yeah. they, but, and, and, uh, and most of them turned out to be meaningful, even though, it, even if we didn't see what the point of it was, ultimately, you know, why do you need to learn how to fold your clothes and store them away properly? Well, it's so that you don't clog the pumps when the ship is going down and you take everybody with you because you were sloppy with your clothes. Um, but uh, but I digress. Um, but so, yeah, I think meaningful experience. I, I think one of the issues that a lot of people have with this new phrase is that we're again changing our language. When I got into it, it was, you know, uh, instruction and training and training and development and training was for the current job. Development was for the next job because, you know, people are usually, you know, moving up or out or, you know, someplace else and not going to stay in one job for their entire career. But, and then, and then with Sengi and, and, uh, um, the fifth discipline and the learning organization, all of my clients in the 90s started changing from training to learning, and they became learning and development as if they were the learning organization. I, I'm not sure that everybody always understood that, but, but their executives were reading that book, and so everybody had to kind of get aligned with that. Um, and there was a need to be proactive and think about the learner. So again, I think this learning experience, the learner experience and designing for that experience and making it meaningful, making it something that's going to more readily transfer back to the job and have impact because it was good stuff, taught them how to do their job. And, you know, so I think those are really key things here, but our, our language has been a, a huge issue and, and I I, I, I'm okay with it now. I remember Joe Harless complaining about this in the East and I didn't really get it because I was, you know, kind of still kind of new, but, but I do get it now and I understand there's a need and it's okay for this to change. It just makes it more difficult for new people coming in because they get this onslaught of all of these all this terminology and is training different than learning, you know, and yes or no is the answer depending on who you talk to because we don't have any set of a standard glossary that everybody has glommed onto and, and uses faithfully. You know, we're, we're kind of sloppy with that. And again, it was the late Joe Harless in the eighties complaining about if you want to have a science of performance, science of instruction, or nowadays the science of learning, you can't do that very well unless you have some common standard language and with standard definition mm -hmm. meanings that everybody kind of subscribes to. So that's been difficult, but that's, but that's the point of my question is that we are opportunity rich as that joke goes with, uh, with cleaning up our language. Um, sure. <laughs> so, so my, my, this uh, next question before we get close to wrapping up here is that I'd like to explore, uh, go back a little bit and talk about some of the people who have had influence to you. And they don't have to be known names. You did mention a couple of people here that probably won't be known by, by most people, but it's a chance for you to give a little shout out to some, some people, a select few perhaps, that, that have had impact to you and what it is that you learn from them. Because again, this is for our audience so that they could say, oh, that's interesting. I maybe want to check out you know, what that was all about not necessarily the person, or I may want to check out the person or that resource. So let's kind of circle back to that a little bit about some of your influences and uh, um, what would you share for, for our audience? Well, yeah. I, when I was uh, in uniform not too long ago, I, I used to, uh, you know, I would always be surrounded by folks who were, who were, who were doing training, right? Or, you know, part of the training system. 
and uh, and and everyone loved to you know delve into the that standard not standard but you know the library of books about HPT or training and it's all the same names and we all love 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 doing that but I would I would say to them hey you know have you read have you read the doctrine on this the actual military doctrine on 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 such and such well no I haven't well, okay have you read um, you know, great book, General Mattis's uh, memoirs. Have you read that? Well, no. Why? Why are you directing me there? Because these are real people, and whether it's real doctrine that folks have written, or it's it's someone's memoir about you know a real person who's widely respected, who's done something. We have a lot to learn from these folks. So I think uh, you know that's my preface. My my influences. Uh, I have. <laughs> I remember years ago seeing the movie Lawrence of Arabia. Uh, and we used to have this old repertory theater here uh, and, uh, and, you know, we got tickets and it was a film festival and it's just a magnificent David Lean movie. I mean, it is, it is magnificent. And I got interested in Lawrence's life and I read the seven pillars of wisdom and I read different stories about T Lawrence. And uh, honestly, I think, I think the stories of T Lawrence and T Lawrence himself were, were a huge influence on me. If you think about what, what, what he did you know, kind of going off as one of very few uh, officers, you know, into uh, into the unknown, if you will, um, learning how to adapt, you know, what he had learned to something new, working with a different group of people uh, that, you know, he wasn't really part of. He was more of an advisor. If you think of these things, and I know I'm kind of simplif- oversimplifying here, I kind of think of folks who work in our line of business as a little bit like, you know, the, the, the modern day, obviously not war fighting T.E. Lawrence, but we, we do this, right? We're, we tend not to be the people who are the corporate people or the, the business people or the people who come in and advise and say, hey, you know, we've got a really great idea here. Let's work together on this. So T.E. Lawrence was a huge influence. You know, go read Seven Pillars of Wisdom. Um, if, you, if I look to things that are a little bit closer to home, though, I've mentioned Brett a, a bunch of times, you know, uh, huge influence on me. And, and I think folks should check out a lot of Brett's work and go to, uh, I think it's Workplace Performance Consulting, his business, check it out. So shout out there, free advertising. Uh, he's got a lot of good things to say. Um, uh, geez, what else? Uh, <laughs> I I'm going to have to stop there because I think I've got too many names floating through my head. <laughs> but no, there, that- there are, yeah. No, I was going to say that, that that's that's very interesting about the uh, Lawrence of Arabia that 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 this going into the unknown, which is what a lot of times we're doing in training, we're venturing into areas that we may know something about, but we now you have to get into the specifics about you know the actual thing, whatever it is, whatever that performance revolves around, people and systems and technology and data, and we have to go and kind of. Explore explore that and so that's what i took away from what you were saying is that um uh, we're going into the unknown often and it's it's yeah i think that's where you have to be careful about checking you know what do you think you already know because you might be wrong and so don't be so presumptuous about you know what you know going into that you can maybe seek to confirm some of the things that you think you might know and and be open to the fact that perhaps you don't or perhaps there's nuances that you didn't appreciate before but i think we're always going in into those kinds of uh situations um um, i think that's an internal consultant or external yeah i mean you we have a lot of science nowadays to back our back our claims up that's for sure and our practice up and a lot of a lot of history and success points some of the practices and procedures and models that we use um but man, if you go into if you go into a situation, whether I, I used to be walking into a room of you know sailors or something, or or now I'm going into a room of, of other folks, if you go in there thinking that that you're not about to learn something, then you're dead wrong, because <laughs> you're going to learn a heck of a lot while you're guiding folks through the process, and it's a it's a beautiful thing, really. Yeah, it's been that, that I I can't imagine, you know, having done something else with my career, but. Uh... Um, so, so let me begin our, our wrap up here, Brad. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this video interview with me. And so I have one last question, and that's what kind of guidance uh, would you have, parting words of wisdom 
for our audience, especially the people that are not necessarily young, but new to the field, whether they're young or old, but coming into a training and development, a learning and development kind of an organization, you know, what, what have you learned? You've done this several times now, both in the military and in, the, in civilian life. What guidance would you have for them? Um, so I, I would say, um, and I guess I, I tend to group things in threes here mentally. I, I've just found out something about myself. I was going to say, I would say three things. Uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> you, for folks starting out, if you're really going to do this, you're going to, you're going to have to expect the following. You're going to go into a situation where <clears throat> people, people's, people have an intuition. They've got, they know, they probably know something's wrong, right? Maybe something's not working correct. They're not producing something or they're taking too much time to do something. Their gut is going to tell them something. They're going to have some sort of preconceived notion about what the solution is. And 99% of the time that solution is going to have the word training. In it. And what we are going to do is we're going to go in there. We're going to confirm to them that, yeah, your, your intuition is right. You're, you're, you have done something good here because you picked up on it. You've asked for help. Let's figure out the second part. So how to solution this is probably not as obvious as you think. So, you know, we can bring in some things, things to help them, help them analyze things, whether it's in teams or alone or whatever. And that 99% of the time, the solution isn't true. <clears throat> so on the one hand, we're going to have to tell them they're probably wrong on something, but they're probably really right on something. And in the middle, we're going to help them. And if they're prepared, if new people are prepared to have that conversation hundreds of times, <laughs> then they're in the right business because you're going to have that same conversation over and over and over again. So that's my, that's my word of advice. Good advice, Brad. Thank you so much. Again, thanks for agreeing to do this video with me and sharing some of your thoughts about uh, human performance technology. Have a great day. Yeah, thanks, Guy. It was a real pleasure. You have a great day, too. Cheers.